the title of my sermon today is, Nuh-uh. <laughs> While hum humanity has progressed and advanced and made great strides in the art of communication, I still believe that the entirety of the human language can be summarized in two phrases, uh-huh or nuh-uh. Every imaginable conversation fits into one of these two categories. For example, who here has ever had a disagreement growing up with their sibling? We all know what, how that goes, right? You know, Mom said you have to take out the trash. She did not. Yes, she did. Nuh-uh, uh-huh, nuh-uh, uh-huh. Not much difference if you watch CNN and Congress. <laughs> nuh-uh, uh-huh, nuh-uh, uh-huh. I mean, even in the church, so much of the conversations are now framed around who was right, who was wrong, who was welcome, who was not, and in the end boils down to nuh-uh, uh-huh, nuh-uh, uh-huh. I mean, early, even in the early years of the church, it was true. Like our scripture today about the disciple Thomas. Now you heard Joe read the story. We remember the story. He's the disciple who wouldn't believe that Jesus had risen. And his conversations with, with the other disciples fit the exact same pattern. The other disciples. Thomas, Jesus has risen from the dead. Thomas, nuh-uh. Disciples, uh-huh. Thomas, nuh-uh. Disciples, uh-huh. <laughs> now the wording in the book of John was a bit more formal. But that was the gist of what was said. And to be honest, I've always felt a certain kinship with Thomas, with doubting Thomas, as we like to call him. Thomas, the one who wasn't ready to summarily accept every single thing the disciples told him. In fact, Thomas goes a step extra. He goes so far as to say, I will not believe it until I see the nail marks and put my hand in his side. Now many folks hold Thomas out as a negative example. You know, Thomas, the one who doubted Jesus. Thomas, the one who puts Jesus to the test. But I don't see it that way. I don't see Thomas's request as a testing, like the devil in the desert. You know, who command, told Jesus, command these stones to become loaves of bread or jump off this cliff and let's, let the angels catch you. Those were tests based on the devil's intention to trip Jesus up. Those were based on doubt. Thomas's questions were based on hope. He desperately wanted to believe. He asked for what he needed to believe and Jesus gave it. I mean, Thomas's story is our story, if we really think about it. I mean, we all have doubts, if we're honest. It's part of being human. And unlike, say, a blowfish or an Irish setter, human beings were given the power of reason. It is a gift given at birth. And as my mom used to say, it is rude not to use a gift that someone gave you. Or said another way, uh, I saw a sign on a fellow pastor's office door one time that said, Jesus died to take away your sins, not your mind. That said, sometimes we follow Thomas' example, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we just blindly believe stuff without any questions or serious consideration. I mean, relationships can be like that sometimes. I mean, let me ask you this. Have you ever been in a relationship, family, friends, partner, whatever, where you so desperately wanted to believe that something was right and okay that you ignored the signs that it wasn't? That you just choose not to ask the questions? Or news reporting, hello. I mean, you read or hear things about people or events or issues that you desperately want to be true, so you don't ask the questions. 
If you don't take anything else away from today, take this. In this political environment, we cannot afford to shy away from the hard questions. Amen? All right, well, let me share another example. This one, a little lighter, a little more personal, and it's not flattering, but I'll share it anyway. A few weeks ago, I was watching a Susan Lucci infomercial <laughs> after taking a break from hours of studying scripture. Okay. Um, <laughs> And there she was on screen, you know, talking about this skin cream that was guaranteed to smooth out every single line on your face in three days. Okay, I knew it wasn't going to do that, but I wanted it to be true, so I didn't ask any questions. <laughs> I mean, this kind of faith may be fine if you're trying to fight crow's feet, but this is not okay for developing a deep spiritual faith. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want a faith where I'm scared to ask God questions. I don't want to have a relationship with God that resembles some kind of repressive regime. I want a faith like Thomas's. Thomas, who hoped beyond all hope that Jesus had risen, but, but he gave voice to his doubts nonetheless. He had the courage to say, nah uh to ask the hard questions. I think we could all use a little more Thomas in our lives. And you know what? It's actually very easy to do because Thomas just used two simple steps. And the first one was he embraced his doubts. He embraced his doubts. I mean, we, we have to embrace those doubts because guess what? God welcomes them. It's a rich place where faith can be born. It's like the great theologian Frederick Buechner once said, whether your faith is that there is a God or that there is not a God, if you don't have any doubts, you're either kidding yourself or you're asleep. Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. So step one, we've got to embrace those doubts. And then step two, the most important part, we have to ask God for what we need to overcome those doubts. It's that simple. What is it that you need from God to restore your faith? I mean, this could be a range of things. I mean, maybe it's courage in the first place to face your doubts. It's scary to stare doubt straight down. It's scary. Maybe it's just asking for courage. Maybe like Thomas, we need to ask for some type of sign. I mean, personally, I'd stay away from earthquakes and eclipses. Just saying. But I don't think there's anything wrong in asking God to open our eyes to see what messages, what, what signs, what sources of healings are right in front of us. Because guess what? They are right in front of us. And as we talked about at Easter, most of them we miss. Or maybe what you need is a restoration of passion in your life because you just stop caring. Some of you know I was in Dayton, Ohio for a couple of days for a conference and I flew in last night and I don't know what was going on with the flight attendant, but she had stopped caring. <laughs> And then right as the plane, you know, is taxing to take off, she comes in to do the announcements and did the whole set of announcements looking out the porthole window with no eye contact with the least amount of voice inflection you've ever heard. It was like, welcome. We're so glad you're flying with us today. We appreciate your business. Please give me your attention while I talk to you about the safety features on this plane. If we hit a pocket of air that is unstable, then a mask might drop down and you should put it on. Blah, 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 blah. I was like, oh my gosh, how scary is it to have a flight attendant who's supposed to be there for you in the case of emergency who does not care? Maybe, maybe we need some courage, maybe we need a sign, or maybe we just need to restore some passion in our life, or maybe what we need is just the strength to live with the questions. The great poet Rainier Rilke wrote this, be patient toward all that is unresolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves. Live the questions now. 
perhaps you will then gradually live into the answer. But let me throw in this caveat here. This is not all on God, okay? This is not just about asking God what we need to restore our faith. Because friends, we have some skin in this game too. Many of you know our global family member, Paul Lambert, who lives out in California. He also publishes this wonderful blog, and lo and behold, this morning I was reading it, and it was spot on today's message. And so I want to share what he wrote. His point was this, we, we need to take the initiative to get to know God. And he wrote this, if you are not sure that you trust God's promises, you need to get to know God. Because it's hard to trust someone you don't know. Amen? And he goes on to say, read what God says. Read what God has done in the Bible. And as you gain more confidence, you'll realize that God never forgets. And God never abandons God's promises. Friends, when we admit our doubts, when we ask God for help, when we pray, when we make efforts to get to know God, transformations can happen. Moments of grace. It's like the lyrics of Doug Shapiro's offertory he's going to be singing in just a moment. In heaven's eyes, there are no losers. In heaven's eyes, no hopeless cause. Only people like you with feelings like me, amazed by the grace we find. Friends, there's something, there's something deep inside of all of us that wants to believe. It's like a homing signal kind of bringing us back to our source. You know, there's a saying in the religious world that we all have a God-shaped hole inside of us. Think about that. We all have a God-shaped hole inside of us and that our entire life is basically trying to fill that hole. To ask questions is our attempt to fill that space. It's our attempt to reconnect with our source. Asking questions is a sign we care. (laughs) It's only when we stop asking questions that we know our heart has closed up. So this week... Let's be a little honest with ourselves. Let's be honest with God. Let's give voice to our doubts. Let's pray about our doubts, the places where we say, nah. Let us ask God for what we need to move from doubt to faith. And then, I mean, maybe with a little grace, we might, like Thomas, eventually be able to say, my Lord and my God. And the people said, Amen. Amen.